The dialogue graph is a subgraph that displays conversations on the campaign table. As with story nodes, you can add text, images, and sounds. I've just added a little description text and an image for now. The demarcate dialogue choices option sets whether or not you'd like for the text to appear grayed out when previously fully explored or red when it will exit the dialogue. These are just options that you have to make it easier to navigate for the player, but are not strictly required. You can toggle them off here. As with any subgraph, to enter a dialogue graph, simply double click. And I've already added a few dialogue nodes here. There are other nodes that you can add, and we, each of these nodes will also have its own unique tutorial video. But right now what we're looking at is just a standard linear conversation. I'm adding a background here, and we're continuing that way. So let's just see how this plays out in the campaign table. So I start with this conversation. There's no background going. I can change the images of the speaker at any time. Here I have set it to the party leader, which in this case was Mason. So whatever the party leader was would be used here. And then now we add a background. You can be changing uh, all kinds of things here, whether it be the music, the ambiance. Uh, you can also um, change the lighting uh, and you can add custom sound effects. And there's going to be a couple of other nodes that we're going to jump back to the graph to look at. So first things first, if I was to add a reward or a punishment node, you're going to notice right away that they're set to hidden by default. The options will also be uh, just a little bit more limited than a reward or punish node outside of a dialogue graph. This is so that it can work within the flow of dialogue. If you wanted to access a feature of a reward or a punishment that is not currently present in these list of choices, then you would just want to throw a flag and listen for that flag outside of the dialogue. So let's say that I would say uh, I'm going to add, well, well, let's just use our for now since that was what came up. Outside of the graph, I would come here and I would check to see if our has been incremented or not. And then I would either give the reward or the punishment or not. So that's just a very quick example of how you can still access all of the functionality of rewards and punishments through dialogue choices and not the dialogue graph itself. The other nodes that we're going to look at that are unique here, if I go into advanced and I go down to the combat option, you're going to notice combat message and combat effects. Combat message is pretty straightforward. Again, I'll create a tutorial video for this node as well, but it's very straightforward. So just looking at it, it's going to add a message. You can say how long it's going to wait, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to display just you as you see the text that comes across the screen at some point during a round or an encounter. Then the other node that we can add is a, a lot more complicated because basically what it allows you to do is it allows you to pretty much control every aspect of an ability and the game uh, in a piecemeal form. So you can move cameras, you can trigger animations, effects, actually cause effects, spawn things, uh, remove things from the board, all of these things, add combat text, add sounds, are all done separately. And that can be a little bit more involved, particularly when you go to the advanced setting that allows you to filter what entities are going to be used. But this is basically the most advanced node in the entirety of the game. And the reason for that is that it is going to interact with the settings of a triggered dialogue. So let's look at what a triggered dialog is. I would just come here and click on the triggered by event checkbox. And immediately I'm presented with a list of choices as to what might trigger this dialog. And when I say trigger this dialog, I mean that it's going to occur when this condition is met. Typically, this is going to be uh, something in combat. So it's going to be when an ability is activated, um, when a certain phase of combat begins, whether it be deployment or a round start. You can also go by entity movements, entities taking their turns, when something dies, even when an entity is inspected, you can do that. You can do it at level starts, you can do it at equip screens, level ends, upgrades, all kinds of things. And then these final options over here are actually more or less just for tutorialization purposes. They're still available to you, but I don't recommend using them unless you have a very specific reason for it. 
So now let's take a closer look at one trigger in particular, just to see what kind of options are open and available to us. Uh, some of these are going to change based on the type of trigger. But if we're going to do something like, let's say an entity turn start, and again, this filter would be covered in a separate video, but really quickly, I'm just gonna choose when Magnar starts his turn. So at this point, the game would be listening to whenever Magnar starts his turn. Outside of this uh, actual options that are unique to the type of trigger, you'll see that we have a number of activations. So this is how many times this can trigger. Maybe I'm just throwing a flag in here. So I would like to keep track of the on the when, when Magnor has taken seven turns, something is going to happen. So I'm counting a flag in there and there'd be a check somewhere else. I set it to zero. It's an unlimited number of times. That means every time that Magnor starts his turn, this would trigger whatever logic is inside of it. If I go by party member, maybe I wanted to do instead of Magnor, I would be removing this and just going by player. So every time that a player starts their turn and be very careful, this gets me sometimes to include transformed entities. If you wanted it to still count when a transformed player starts their turn. And if you wanted to include summons there, you have it as well. So now I would say, I want to trigger this one time for every party member. If there are five party members, it would trigger five times, regardless of whether they're transformed or not. Maybe I'm just adding some kind of an, uh, of an effect, a buff or a debuff to those party members. Then we have the capacity to reset this uh, based on every level, encounter, round, or turn. You can also add a tag to a trigger. Now, what the point of that is, is because you're actually sort of registering a listener, if you're familiar with that uh, from programming. So you are able to say, hey, I'm going to just call this uh, right now. I only have day, so let's just call it the day tag. And later on, I can actually with a modify, the modify node that is, I can remove the listener for day. The trigger dialog can actually happen inside of combat. So I'm going to set that up really briefly so that we can see what that would look like. I'm just going to do on combat on round start. I'm going to set it to one so it'll only trigger once and it'll trigger on the very first round start. I just need to add a level here so that I can actually trigger this and we'll launch into the campaign. So as you can see, the dialogue once it's set to triggered is not visible on the campaign table. Here I am, I've loaded into the level. Still, the dialogue has not occurred. Here comes an encounter. The dialogue has not occurred yet. And it should also let me go right through the deployment phase. And only when the round starts would that dialogue trigger. So here comes the round. And there's my dialogue, the same as it would have appeared on the table, but now it's appearing inside of the level. So this could be a dialogue that I triggered perhaps when uh, some one of my allies was defeated or when I've defeated the boss or when the boss is taking a turn. And now I'm ready to continue with combat. I could have another dialogue tree that is going to happen after combat. And now that is an easy way for you in to integrate stories into the flow of a level. So now let's look at a really advanced use of this system here. Go down to the ability tab and you'll notice that there's ability activation and ability action acted. Uh, the difference here is the ability activations are going to be more for just an ability if you want to listen to when an ability is used. Ability action acted, we're going to use this one just because it's the most complicated one and I want to go through all of the process here. So we first are going to choose the actor, which is going to be the player and be very careful here that we and listen to summon entities and transformed entities as well. So we're just listening to all. So anyone on the player's side, and now we choose what kind of action. In this case, we're just going to do damage. So we're just listening for when a player damages who? The enemy. So we set dungeon, and again, we can set to include both transformed and summoned entities. Lastly, we have this ability filter. When it's filtered like this, I can then choose all kinds of options uh, based on the uh, qualities of the ability. I can also choose a specific ability, like I could say only from Chop, for instance. Maybe I've granted the ability to all of the players and I'm listening for when they damage an enemy using the Chop ability to trigger some kind of an event. 
In this case, we're not gonna need that. We're going to leave it to filtered and leave it open-ended. So anytime that a player damages an enemy, we're going to trigger this event. I can also set a power range. So if they're barely doing any damage or if they're doing a lot of damage, I can set a range there, but we'll leave it open-ended. And then I can use the entity to use as the trigger. So the, the trigger there is going to be used internally inside of this subgraph by the combat effects node. I'm gonna change it to target because what I'm going to be trying to do here is add a snaring effect. So anytime that a player damages an enemy, I am going to add a mobility debuff to that enemy, like we're snaring them. So now I've already set up this combat effects node, which will have its own tutorial video, but I've set it up in a very simple way, just the entity which triggered the event. And remember that we set that to the target instead of the activator. Maybe I wanted to add power to the uh, activator. Anytime that you deal damage, you gain power, I would set it to the activator. I would come in here and I would do the buff that way. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, but what I used was basically just an ability action. And then I just, as you would in an ability, chose what I wanted to do. And so now, anytime that a player were to damage an enemy, they would be snared. And this would continue until I have removed it or until it has had its number of activations. So this is a really interesting way to start creating your own buffs, debuffs, rewards, whatever you want to think of for your campaigns, your spec trees, all these kinds of things. You can create all sorts of very neat uh, interactions that the game will be listening to for as long as you want it to. Of course, using this combat effects note, I could also add combat text. I could add uh, some kind of special effect or a sound or both so that the player has greater feedback as to what's going on. So this is probably the most complicated use, uh, while well, the most complicated interaction that you can look for in Pop-Up Dungeon. And as you can see, if you break everything down one at a time, everything is very simple. You're basically just having the filter for who's using it, uh, what is being listened for, and then who is the target. And then you're selecting all sorts of little neat uh, ways of having the activations restricted, doing it by party members, all of these things are still available to you so that you can fine tune the experience as much as possible.